one up at Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. It's personally, it's one of my favorite places on the planet. And so it's exciting to hear about what's happening and um, appreciate the fact that our, well, it was going to be two, but um, three speakers tonight are going to tell us a little bit about their efforts to, you know, plan for the monument that was created in 2016 and, and develop some, you know, broad concepts of the, what the management will look like for that space. The speakers we have tonight, Noel Musson is a professional land use planner. He has a master's degree in community planning and development from the Muskie School. And Noel has, as you'll tell tonight, has a very participatory planning approach that works with clients, government officials, citizens, and other experts in terms of trying to create livable and sustainable projects. You know, he'd worked as a planner for the town of Harpsville and, you know, grew up on Mount Desert Island and has, you know, taken his expertise around the state. Terry Dewan is an award-winning landscape architect. He has over 40 years of professional experience in landscape architecture, visual resource assessment, site planning, design guidelines, and community development. You know, I said this to this spring, but I first encountered his scenic assessment studies when I moved to Maine, you know, almost 30 years ago. And he sort of, that work kind of rebuts the, you know, age old, age old adage that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, you know, Terry was willing to say, no, we can maybe as a community agree on what's beautiful and figure out how to protect it. And he's done, you know, developed tools that can be used by communities and agencies to really assess, you know, assess scenery. He's also written several studies in community planning, visual impacts, recreation planning, water access, and highway corridors. And then a third person who I think is going to maybe speak right at the beginning is the superintendent of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, Tim Hudson. And Tim has a career of more than 50 years, if I added it up correctly, um, though he doesn't look that old. So he started doing this when he was four, I think, and has worked with the Park Service as an expertise in national park project management. He started his career as a seasonal employee, as many do in the Park Service, worked as a civil engineer um, in what's now the Denver Service Center, became the chief of maintenance at Yellowstone for 20 years, then moved to Alaska and was the Alaska Regional Chief of Maintenance and the Associate Regional Director in Alaska. Hurricane Sandy brought him back to the East Coast. Um, he was responsible for the sort of the recovery efforts for the National Park Service properties that were affected by that hurricane. And then we stole him and he came up to Maine to be the first superintendent of Katahdin Woods and Waters. So we, I mean, Tim, I think is, there were several awards from the Park Service. I think both the the meritorious, um, okay, there was the, some interior meritorious and distinguished service awards, like the two that I saw on his, on his CV. But we've got tremendous amount of expertise and a real high octane group of speakers tonight. And so I'm gonna shut up and let them actually present about this place that they've worked on and know so well. So I don't know if Tim's going to start off or Noel or Terry, but I will turn the, the microphone over to one of you. Well, I think I'll jump in. Um, also, uh, I noticed a few people here, but I will point out that uh, Isabel Ashton's here. She works for with Tim up at um, Katahdin Woods and Waters and Andy Bossy is here um, from Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. They've been super helpful uh, to us throughout this whole process and uh, doing a great job. Um, you know, just promoting the, the monument and doing all the good things that they're doing up there. So just wanted to point out a couple of, uh, of those people. Um, I think on the agenda for tonight, um, if Terry, we have a, we have a presentation that we're going to go through um, and then we'll try to answer any questions at the end. But I think, um, are you getting ready to share screens, I Terry? I really could. Just so everybody can see. Um, what we're talking about. Um, and then I think um, all of us have a pretty, um, we've, we've talked about the monument for the past three years uh, quite a bit together. So uh, we tend to just sort of talk and, and go through and uh, Terry will jump in or I'll jump in or Tim will jump in um, if we have some additional information to add. 
Um, and then maybe toward the end, uh, Tim can jump in and just give us a little update on how things are going um, at the monument uh, currently or with the year of, uh, you know, our, our uh, recent challenges with COVID, um, people getting back out into the, to the wilderness and, and um, kind of what's going on up, up there now, if that makes sense. So um, I think what we're going to try to go over tonight is pretty high level stuff. Um, just to try to give everybody a sense of, um, you know, what the what the background of the project is, um, what we've been doing for the past three years, um, a little bit more information about what Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument is, at least from our um, understanding and research, and then what are what are some of the challenges that we have moving forward. Uh, so we're going to try to hit that hit the high notes and. Um, let, let folks know where we're headed with this. Um, uh, just a little bit of background, most everybody knows, but um, the area that was or is the monument was uh, donated to the National Park Service uh, by Roxanne Quimby, who um, worked really hard and diligently to try to accumulate um, land through acquisition that was going to be, um, you know, given back to the people of, of Maine and to the, to the country. Um, we all know um, Initially, um, you know, the process had some fits and starts, um, but we had a, a, a tide turn, we'll, we'll call it, here down on the coast. And, um, you know, the president, uh, Barack Obama, um, created the National Monument, which we're, we're working on today. So there it was in 2016. Um, and the proclamation is really the basis of where we started from, from um, our work, and you can find it online, and, and uh, it's actually quite an interesting document to read. Our team, um, well, we were asked um, around three years ago to put together a team of Maine professionals um, who are helping us work on this project. And um, we actually, besides Terry and I, we have uh, other members of our team. We have another planner named Van Smith, um, Nancy Montgomery, who is uh, um, you know, world-class uh, interpretive designer, uh, Mark Leathers, who is a forester and has an extensive experience in the area um, that, we're, that we're planning for in the monument and was working with uh, Roxanne prior to um, this area becoming a monument. And Gwen Hilton, who was a chair of um, the Land Use Regulatory Commission back in the day, uh, LUPC today, um, and has a lot of uh, knowledge of rural planning challenges and, and um, been a great team and for me a really really um, great experience working with all these different uh, team members. So as I said the, the planning process is really um, the, the presidential proclamation actually targeted three years for this management planning process to, to occur and it involves two different things. One is something called a foundation document and the other is what we're calling a management framework. We'll get into what that is in a little bit. Um, but the, the foundation documents are really, they're kind of the synthesis of, of monuments resources, the values, the history. Um, it's using some of the legislative language and it's largely a static document. It's, it's really a park um, document, National Park Service document that helps describe the monument's purpose, its significance, um, some special mandates that, that apply to it. And it helps set the stage for, or the builds the foundation of, thus the name, um, what are the special things about the monument and what are the needs of the monument so that we can start to direct uh, different budgetary funds um, and budget requests, um, you know, toward, toward the monument's needs. And the management, management, management framework is a little bit more of a hybrid um, approach for this project, but it's, it's really taking, taking the management ideas up to a basic um, decision making. It, it, it's uh, not a decision making document, but a basic um, high level of, of thinking about different areas of the monument. Um, for those of you who, who are familiar with uh, uh, NEPA, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, it, it really stops short of the requirements of a NEPA document, which would be, um, you know, kind of more specific and require different levels of, of review. But it does consider um, identification of opportunities, problems, conflicts, um, additional management planning needs, and what we're calling management areas. So it's like the, I call it a guidance document too, or, or if you want to talk in municipal terms, um, 
you know, it's, it's sort of like the master plan, but not master plan in the terminology that the park service would use. And uh, throughout the time that we've been working on this, we've had an extensive amount of community engagement processes. We've been all over the state of Maine. We've had meetings in the north. We've had meetings in the Patton uh, Millinocket area. We've had meetings in the Bangor area. We've had meetings in Portland. Um, and now we're having virtual meetings. So this is, <laughs> we, I think, hopefully we're trying to cover it all. Uh, and through that, we've really tried to identify or get, get gotten feedback from people across the state of Maine um, about winter activities, about infrastructure needs, about those range of experiences within the monument, about the compatibility of different types of uses with that, that happen in the monument. So you see some, uh, uh, we've developed, um, you know, uh, uh, different tools that we've tried to use to help solicit feedback. So this is an example of a winter use exercise where we tried to talk about conflicts or compatibility of different types of winter activities. We've um, done some um, different feedback to, to have people walk around to, to different stations to talk about cultural resources or natural scenic uh, recreational areas to help us identify any data gaps that we might have missed or get some thoughts on future management areas. So we're really building our knowledge base. That, that's, that's how we started. We wanted to hear from other people and then build our knowledge base. So where is it? Um, I'm not sure how many people have actually been to the monument, but um, it's about 100 miles from where I am right now in, in uh, the lovely town of Southwest Harbor on Acadia or near Acadia National Park. Um, comparatively to Baxter State Park, it's, it's adjacent to Baxter State Park, but we're talking about 137 square, mile, square miles or about 87,000 acres. Um, but this map really shows the, the comparison and, and the link really between Baxter State Park and Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. So, um, Terry, you can jump into um, for these ones, but uh, what we learned, I think, over the course of our um, um, work and, and uh, experience at Katahdin Woods and Waters is it really is many places and many faces. So every, there, Anywhere you go in the monument kind of has like, there's uh, different characteristics. So you see this map to sort of illustrate some of the, some of what we're thinking. Yeah, no, this is Terry here. Uh, Noel and I did a similar presentation to Ken's class and uh, some of the slides that you see were borrowed heavily from that presentation. Um, when we talked to them though, uh, we actually had them do a, uh, an academic exercise to help come up with a management framework of their own without the benefit of what we've done. It was a very interesting exercise. But in looking at the monument, we said, it's 87,000 acres. How do you develop a, a vision for such a large area? And so we encouraged the students to break it down into smaller manageable pieces. And so this is an attempt right here to show uh, six different areas that each have its own separate identity. Oh, do you want to go through here? Do you want me to, you want to tag you? Going, Terry, you're doing good. Nobody okay. wants to hear me anymore. I, you know, it, it would be, if we were doing this live, we would ask people to raise their hand. How many people have been here already? So I, I just assume that at least half the people in the this digital room have been here already. And you probably have a great love for the place. And if you don't, you're probably going to wish that you have seen it or making plans to see it. But in terms of What's out there? You know, the, the east branch of the Penobscot River is the major water body that runs from the north to the south of the area. Uh, just in terms of you know, subdividing it into big chunks, the, the, the area north um, of, and this area here has many of the outstanding hydrologic features. There's waterfalls, there's beaver flowages, there's rapids, uh, there's Haskell dead waters, there's Haskell Rock, which is a major geologic feature in the middle of the East Branch. There's places to stay, places of historic value, Haskell Hut, overlooking Haskell Deadwater. Once you get to the south of Big Spring Brook there, um, the river changes character. Uh, it's a lot slower. I know Ken talks uh, lovingly about going out there and canoeing this area and just being at ease with the um, uh, the beautiful uh, silver maples that overhang the river. It's really quite a special place and much different from the northern stretches of the river. 
uh, was Tattacook Stream, another major river that runs through the middle of the uh, the monument. It makes up in uh, Baxter State Park. It's known for a lot of uh, log driving history. Uh, there are uh, enormous boulders at Orange Falls right here. In fact, you can see pieces where they actually tried to blow the, the boulders apart uh, when they're during the log driving eras. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, in the middle of the monument, uh, there's an area that's made up of a lot of mountains. The International Appalachian Trail goes through the heart of it. About over 30 miles of the IAT is found within the National Monument. There's some historic structures at the top of Deasy Mountain. There's an old fire lookout uh, that, that's still up there. And then the Loop Road in the southern, uh, southwestern end is probably a place that people uh, know about when they've been to the monument. This is one place that people are gravitated, gravitated to because of the Loop Road. Um, it's a pretty rudimentary road. Uh, there's a, a few shots here that show what it looked like a couple of years ago. I know there's plans right now that Andy might be able to talk about to upgrade the, uh, the overlook at mile 10, which has a spectacular view of, of Mount Katahdin. And then along the way, there's uh, a, a multitude of other things to see. Small ponds, uh, the hike up to Barnard Mountain, the view uh, from the top of uh, Barnard Mountain to the top there uh, is really what most people identify with when they think of KWW. And then on the east side, east side of the, the, uh, the east branch, this is Boyas Parcel. This is 14,000 acres of land, uh, again, with its own special character. You know, it uh, borders on Lower Shin Pond, but there's very little access onto it. Uh, it's accessed by the American Thread Road, passing by places like Kimball Deadwater and Kimball Brook. Uh, there's a loop road, uh, as you can see in the, the middle of the um, the, the oval there that provides access uh, down to the Savoyas River. Um, and it's a place that uh, is, again, very different from the rest of the monument. That's one of the things that's fascinating about KWW is that the variety of different experiences and opportunities that are out there. Terry, I would also add, you know, uh, just a reaction to the Savoyas parcel is it's just, um, it's such a unique area. <clears throat> But it's also kind of a mini monument, so it's it's one of the areas that's a little more close. It's a little closer to a main road. Um, you still get um, quite a bit of the same and similar experiences. And um, didn't we determine it was almost it's bigger than any other state park in Maine? That that's that right. area. That's right. It's much bigger than any of the state parks. If this was a state park, it would be the largest state park other than Baxter right. in the state of Maine. Okay, so how do we go about determining what's out there? Well, um, one of the advantages of working with uh, such a remarkable team is that there is a lot of good information available uh, through places like Sewell Company, uh, through the Office of GIS, uh, various agencies, and we looked at a variety of different resources. The natural resources, of course, which most people think about when they think of a national monument. And by, national, by natural resources, you know, we mean things like wildlife habitat and places of ecological significance. Um, there are two areas, focus areas of statewide ecological significance that either border on or are part of KWW, the, the Baxter region to the north and the east branch, the Savoyas River, Wasatica Stream uh, to the south. There's also, again, a lot of good detailed information uh, from beginning with habitat, for example. Uh, maps that uh, illustrate where high value plant and animal habitat uh, are located. Um, we did a lot of work on water resources because after all, this is uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, looking at the rivers that flow through it, the small streams that feed into the rivers and streams, uh, this very special ponds are the remote ponds that are classified by the Land Use Planning Commission as remote ponds. Uh, we had to take into consideration uh, watershed divides uh, and wetlands that are found throughout the area. Uh, beginning with habitat maps, uh, if you haven't seen them, are wonderful resources. They offer a lot of detail. 
Um, and I, this is just an enlargement of the place where the three rivers join together, with Sadakuk in the, the lower left, East Branch in the middle, and the Seboyas River coming down from the north. And as you can see from the labeling here, uh, these show the approximate location of various species of special concerns, of threatened species, natural communities, uh, that are indicative of the sort of richness of the habitats that are out here. Uh, Noel, why don't you talk a little bit about the cultural resources, because you've been doing a lot of that recently. Sure. Yeah, we're, um, you know, again, one of the important things about the monument is the, the vast amount of cultural resources from um, this area being homeland to the Wabanaki people, to um, logging and um, the history with um, um, Roosevelt and others in that in this area. So we, what we try to do through this process is collect as much information as we have, but also um, recognizing that some of the data that we have available uh, may, may be something we call data gaps. And that's something that goes into the planning process that we need to look at. Um, we've actually been spending quite a bit of time with uh, the Wabanaki um, representatives to try to integrate their story into what we're writing for both the foundation document and the management plan. So um, we can talk about that um, later, but, but quite a bit of time um, trying to understand from them, you know, what, what's important culturally to these areas and how we, how we work that into the process. Uh, we'll also be identifying um, the start of some interpretive themes. When people come to national parks or national monuments, uh, it's very often an educational experience. And so one of the themes that make this place so unique, so special, certainly as, as Noel just pointed out, the Native American culture and the connections to the land, to the land forms, to the rivers is extremely important. Um, the logging history and the working lands um, are a fascinating story to see how this area has been, has been treated over the years, uh, coupled with the forest fires that have, have really played a major role in the, the way the landscape looks today. And then there's the whole story of the transition that went from logging to the sports and the recreationists, the people, the sports who came up here to climb Mount Katahdin and the places that they visited along the way, the places that they stayed. Uh, the monument line, early surveying uh, attempts to uh, denote what's out there. Uh, and then the story of the early conservationists, the recreationalists, the artists, the photographers who came here in droves when they start, started to hear about the, the wonders of this area. And then last but certainly not least, the local history of the, the people that lived around here, the local towns and the, the culture that's built up around the National Monument lands. I think we like to say that, that this area is a good, um, another great example of Maine's North Woods and all the magic and um, stories that go along with that. The National Park Service, of course, is, is famous uh, for the preservation and display of scenic resources, and KW Debu is not any, uh, not the exception there. We, we certainly have an, a wonderful number of places that people go to because they're drawn to, to things like the views from the top of Bar Barnard Mountain, uh, the views from the Loop Road, uh, the oversized boulders at Oran Falls, the tranquility of stretches of the rivers and the waterfalls, the, the scenic overlooks, the, the small ponds and so forth. Um, we've developed, we're starting to develop maps that show where these places are. Uh, we are not at this point, however, uh, doing anything to show how these places might be improved. That might be uh, a later phase down the road but we certainly are recognizing the importance that the monument plays and the, uh, the resources of the, the whole area surrounding Mount Katahdin um, and the other preserved lands. Uh, land use and forestry, as I mentioned, is a major component of the history of the area. Uh, there's a lot of evidence um, as you drive through. Uh, some of the roads that you travel on are shared by uh, active logging operations. In many places, uh, logging companies own one side of the road and the monument owns the other side of the road. There's a lot of evidence of, of logging activity in years gone by. There's uh, most of the road network that you can travel on uh, were done as a result of gaining access for, for logging operations. Um, yeah, I, 
I also think, Terry, this is important to kind of think about, as, as this slide indicates, that you know the past logging history also indicates different types of habitat and how things are regenerating um, within within the monument itself. So it's an actual, um, you know, a really good example of how different habitats get to grow back or, or how, how the landscape is affected by this type of forestry. Uh, so what company, of course, um, does a lot of work in forest management. And as, as Noel said, um, uh, Mark Leathers has been working on this land for probably a dozen years or so when uh, the previous owner first got involved in it. And he knows the area. He knows every tree and bush that's out there. And he said it's amazing to go drive through the area and look at places that, you know, five to 10 years ago had been heavily harvested. And you probably aren't going to recognize the fact that these uh, had, that had been uh, so heavily harvested today. Um, if you look at the map on the left, you'll see a dotted line. This is on the uh, Saboyas property, just to the south of Lower Shin Pond. On the right, I took a Google Earth map and enlarged it just to show what this area looked like about five years ago. And as you can see, that's a whole network of logging roads and skitter roads. Um, and I would guarantee if you went out there today, you know, just five or six years later, you'd be hard pressed to find evidence of a lot of this activity. Uh, we hear a lot of people when they talk about the monument, describing it in terms of its wilderness character or the fact that it is wilderness. Well, it's pretty hard to think that given its most recent history, that this would be classified as a wilderness, at least not right now. Access, of course, is uh, one of the issues that we have to deal with in terms of uh, providing a way for people to get there. Um, you know, it's, it's not an easy place to get to. Uh, the the uh, map on the left shows the major uh, public roads that lead into the monument. Uh, the map on the right shows the, in yellow, the, the roads that are currently within the monument. Uh, most of these are, um, are unpaved gravel roads in various uh, conditions, but people do find it. And they are putting signs up uh, just this year. Um, visitor use experiences and the types of recreation, of course, is one of the main draws. Uh, people want to know, well, once I get there, what can I do? Well, there's a wide variety of things that are available for people. You know, um, hiking, of course, horseback riding, um, hiking across streams, uh, fishing, uh, just exploring on bicycle, on foot. And then uh, during the winter time, there's an equal number of uh, activities that are available for people from ski joring, uh, which is uh, dogs pulling uh, people on skis, to people winter camping. Uh, stargazing is a major uh, 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 sport now or activity that uh, is certainly uh, drawn a lot of attention because of, a, of, a, of the monument's designation as a dark sky uh, memorial. Okay, Noel, do you want to take a crack yeah. at the next group? So all that um, background information and the information that we were able to gather uh, through our public process, um, what we're trying to do is develop something called a management framework which is basically, um, it's based upon a sound vision for the monument. So taking all the information and thinking about how this um, area should be or could be managed in the future. And it really relies on our knowledge of cultural, the natural, the scenic, the historic and, and natural resources that Terry just went over. And also considering um, comments that we've gotten back from the public from different agencies, from non-governmental organizations that we've met with, and from the Park Service itself, and from the donor. Um, and it acknowledges um, also that there are some stipulations that were from the Presidential Proclamation and from uh, existing deeds that are, um, you know, part of the company that we're managing. So what the, what the management framework is not, um, is a really highly detailed plan. It's more of a vision plan. Uh, we don't propose any specific actions in the management plan. Those will really come later um, and will be guided by this management framework. 
Um, it's not a land use plan in the sense that we're going to illustrate the location of new trails or roads or campgrounds or any of that. Um, that will also come later as part of the process. But what it really does is sets the vision for the monument, um, thinking about um, how to guide future decision making makers who are going to actually do the physical plans or put the details to management policies or think about interpretive um, plans and locations for interpretive signage and other components of the, of the future of the monument. So what we were able to develop, um, this, is a, this is sort of the high level view of what we're calling the management areas map. So you can see uh, several different colors here, which we'll go over, but um, we've broken the monument into uh, different areas which have different characteristics and different management objectives associated with it. So we've come up with uh, gateway areas where we describe what those are going to be, um, where the, those are the areas where they're essentially just entry, you know, your first um, touch in the monument, uh, different points along the way. What, what, could, what should or could happen in those areas? Developed recreation areas, which are the orangey colored um, um, locations on this map, uh, where more development, more people are going to be, or the river corridors, thinking about how each of the river corridors has a different experience. And, and along the east branch, what um, you'll see in later slides, more of a transition between experiences as you go down uh, the branch. Um, some more less intensive uh, use areas and some backcountry areas, we're calling them, each having a different kind of visitor experience. So we, in the management framework also includes, uh, besides the map, a matrix, which really puts into more, more descriptive terms that the uh, resource condition of a particular area, um, the, the desired visitor experience of a particular area, the types and levels of development that might be associated with that area, different levels of management or types of management that might be appropriate for that area, and then what types and levels of visitor activity might be appropriate for that area. So it's starting to set the stage for all these future, more detailed planning processes. Yeah, this, the framework is, um, is guided by work that's been done in many other national parks, national monuments around the country. And so we've, uh, we had a great deal of assistance from the Park Service who, uh, who steered us in a certain direction to make sure that we're meeting their criteria for development of, an, of the management framework. So things to keep in mind as we're going through this or as you uh, eventually start to look at and review some of these documents is, is that they're preliminary at this point. Um, we've, we've had a lot of feedback and I think um, hearing very similar comments. Uh, so we're really kind of refining the process as we, as we continue right now. Um, and management area boundaries are really starting points for evaluation. Um, but there may be sub areas within each management area. So we've taken it to the, the highest level of view and then you kind of have to start to, as, as the park gets more, as the monument gets more experienced, uh, we'll say there are more levels of detail that can come out of that. But these are, I think about the management plan as like the guardrails that keep you on the, on the road in the direction that you want to head, the big, big direction. If any of you have been to any of the uh, earlier presentations uh, and looking at the slides that we're going to see tonight, you may notice some subtle differences uh, in terms of the mapping. Uh, we're, we've been very responsive to the comments that we've heard by the comments we've heard from the Park Service and Tim and others. And so as we go through there, as, as uh, Noel just mentioned, this is an iterative process. And it certainly is still preliminary, but it's getting to the point where it's going to be release as part of the, uh, the management framework. Do you want to keep going, Terry? Or sure. you want me to jump uh, so the management areas, when we develop these five different areas, were based upon many considerations. You know, you've already seen the maps of the natural, cultural, scenic, recreation resources. That's the stuff that makes up uh, the physical presence of the monument. But what are the existing conditions and what are the facilities that are out there that will play into an understanding about a vision for the future. What are the established land use patterns in terms of, in terms of where people enter, the way uh, the people use the land right now, both on land and on water? Uh, the context is extremely important. The fact that it's immediately abutting Baxter State Park uh, was tremendously important. Uh, Baxter State Park has its own management protocol. 
and certain values that they certainly hold near and dear to their heart. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, address that to some extent as we go through here. There's also, um, you know, we like to think of the Baxter of, of this area as being a giant chocolate chip cookie. And uh, the monument might be one of the chocolate chips, but it's surrounded by a lot of preserved land. And so we have to think about the, the context that it sits within uh, and how it relates to the other, the, 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 the broader landscape around it. Um, the presidential proclamation uh, is certainly full of uh, a description of allowable and not allowable activities and uses uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, the National Park Service has regulations and policy that apply here. And certainly dealing with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is another guidance document when we think about uh, the management areas. Uh, we also had um, a lot of input, as Noel said, from the public. We've had dozens of meetings so far, uh, we in the Park Service, and listening sessions where people came and just uh, unloaded their thoughts and then followed up with great written comments. And as you saw, one individual even came with a sketchbook full of drawings and paintings that he had done out there. Um, we've had many meetings with uh, non-governmental organizations, letters, emails, phone calls, and finally, but next, last but not least, the National Park Service has provided us a tremendous amount of input in the development of this. So the, uh, as Noel said, there are five different management areas. Uh, this is what the area looks like right now. And then if you overlay the, uh, the management area, overview. On top of that, you can see where these five areas are. The gateways, the developed recreation, river corridors, the non-intensive use areas, and the backcountry areas. I'll go through each one of these briefly. Uh, the gateway areas, um, where these purple dots on the map um, are indica indications of where the uh, places where the public is welcome. There's either established entranceways right now, or places that we feel could be developed um, into a place where you may go to uh, get uh, information, or maybe a, a place of, uh, that's a little bit more developed in terms of a, of a structure or parking or a trailhead. We don't know. We've identified where these places might be, uh, knowing that when people arrive, they want to know that they have finally arrived. And then they're going to ask the question, what do I do here? Where should I go? How do I keep safe? What should I expect to see and do here? So, um, yeah, we don't, we are not dictating at this point what sort of facilities happen at each one of these areas, but just recognizing the fact that we do need uh, gateways at certain key locations. These, uh, we've again identified these places, knowing that these are diagrammatic at this point, and some places already have uh, some facilities. Uh, the Matagammon End, for example, um, there are uh, restroom facilities, there's a small parking area, uh, there's trailheads. Other places, uh, like at Sandbank, there's already a, a, a small informal campsite available. At the Savoyas Parcel uh, off the American Thread Road, not much there already, but again, we need something to let people know that, yes, this is where you go to get information. Develop recreation areas. Um, are the areas shown in brown right here. And for the most part, these are areas adjacent to the existing road network. As you can see on the lower left on the map, uh, this is around the loop road. Uh, we're going out maybe a quarter of a mile uh, that says that when people uh, are uh, in these developed recreation areas, they have a certain sensibility. They have a certain level of expectation about what to see. Uh, many of the people may not even get out of their car. They may want to experience the the monument from the, the safety and comfort of their own vehicle. Other people, though, may want to use this as a starting point. People are drawn to these areas by the views of the landscape, especially the more distant landscape. Uh, there's also, especially on the loop road, uh, multiple users from outside the monument who use this. In other words, there are, there's logging activity that take place uh, that use this road. So people have to be made aware of the fact that you're not on a a dedicated road strictly for, for visitor use. Um, as we mentioned earlier, hunting is allowed on the east, uh, east side of the East Branch, and snowmobiling is allowed on some of these roads in some of these areas. Um, the, the management framework anticipates what sort of uses may happen here. Again, we're not getting any detail, but we know that 
Uh, there may be improvements necessary for roads and turnouts uh, if, if it's desirable. There may be picnic areas and restrooms. But whatever is done here, uh, the, the long-term vision say that they should be relatively unobtrusive. Now, what that means is a design decision that will come later, but laying the framework right now uh, puts it out there that, uh, that the, the natural and physical resources will remain relatively intact. But those are, that should be really the, the dominant experience for people along these developed recreation areas. A lot of activities can take place here. Uh, in addition to sightseeing, uh, there's places where you can go for horseback riding, hiking, uh, star study, and so forth. We also want to make sure that when people go here that uh, the trails are well marked. You know, we may find that the, the type of users who, uh, who frequent these areas aren't necessarily well versed in the use of compasses and, and maps. So there, there needs to be a certain amount of wayfinding that's uh, factored into uh, the, the vision for this area. And then the lastly, you know, what should the character of the roads be? Um, a lot of people are so much concerned that the roads are, are fairly, uh, fairly rough. They're, they're typical of what you may find in, in Maine woods. Um, but, you know, what should the character of these areas of these roads be in the future? Uh, here's a, a blow up of the loop road on the left. And here's a couple of views from the, the loop road on the right. As you can see, it's a gravel road. It's and some places it's a two-way road, and one, some places it's a one-way road. It's wide enough for two vehicles to pass, but it's certainly not a road that you're wanna, gonna wanna travel more than say 25 miles an hour on. The river corridors. Um, this is, a, again, some of the real unique parts of this area. Uh, we said that uh, the river corridor as a management area should be probably within a quarter of a mile or so uh, and this is a zone where the people who are either on the river or next to the river feel that they're uh, experiencing the river in some way. They may hear it, they may see it, uh, they may smell it, they may see the, the mist rising off the river. Uh, and these are, the, the, these are the, of course, the major streams and rivers that, define, that are the defining elements of the monument. And for the most part, these are areas of high scenic, recreation, cultural, and ecological value. Um, so this raises a lot of challenges, of course. Um, when you're on the river, you know, what should you expect to see from the people who are on the shoreline? When you're on the shoreline, um, what should, ex should you expect to see? Um, we're saying that the access to these areas should be primarily by trails and that the vehicle access would be, should be very limited and that the signs and sounds, uh, uh, and si the sounds and sights of human activity should be minimized. This is a point we've had a lot of discussion about. People who are coming down the river uh, with a certain level of expectation. Do they want to be able to see parked cars or hear cars driving along the river? Probably not. It's an opportunity though to, to do a lot of thinking about providing uh, for a good visitor experience, uh, protecting the resources that are the river, and of course in places where you've got the waterfalls and the rapids uh, providing for visitor safety. And we certainly anticipate that there will be low impact recreation uh, in most of these areas. Uh, preserving these natural features is going to be high on the priority for what the resources should look like. There's uh, in many places there's going to be high visitor use, especially uh, where, they're, where, they're, where it's fairly, fairly easily accessed. Other places it's a lot more difficult to get to. And there's also a great deal of winter activity with people going out there to cross country ski and snowshoe and camping along the area. And there's also a lot of fat tire biking uh, that's found throughout the monument. Here's a, a few shots of what the, the various places of the river looks, look like right now. As we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> once we've established these larger uh, management areas or zones, we may be subdividing some of them. And the river corridors is one example of how the, the East Branch itself uh, is one system. But when you start to think about it and look at the character of the river, the type of uses that take place right now, uh, the width of the river, uh, the type of water features, it's really possible to divide it up into four, possibly more uh, sub areas. The Upper East Branch, uh, just as you come in from Matagamon, uh, the Oxbow to Haskell Deadwater, a place that's rich in wildlife habitat. The Middle East Branch, where you find you know, the, 
the pitches and the waterfalls and places like the, you know, the, uh, the holding machine, which are named after the, the power of the waters in, in this area. Then we have the Lower East Branch. Uh, we saw some slides in the lower on the upper left here. Uh, that's a much different character. People go there for much different types of experience. But it's a recognition that there are a lot of things that are going on. They're all interrelated. Uh, there's a, a new book that's uh, hopefully going to be coming out in 2021. Uh, by the Friends Group called the Three Rivers Paddling Guide. Uh, hopefully it will be published in full uh, next year, but it contains a wealth of information about what to expect, uh, where the portages are, where you can camp along the way, some of the scenery along the way, some of the natural history. This is one page out of this book. And if you're really interested in uh, going down the rivers, you know, I'd so strongly suggest that you get this book. Uh, the yellow areas uh, are the areas between the river corridors and um, what we're going to end up last of the back country. Uh, these are the areas shown in yellow. This is a, these are areas that are uh, rolling topography as opposed to steep mountainous topography. Uh, there's a lot of streams and small ponds that are found out through here. Uh, the access is primarily by the trail systems, uh, many of which are old logging roads uh, or dedicated use trails. Um, Vehicle access to these areas uh, would, be, uh, would be regulated by gates. So we would allow emergency vehicles, for example, to get back into most of these areas, but probably not open up for uh, normal uh, cars uh, driving through these areas. Uh, the experience that's gonna be anticipated is somewhat between the remoteness of the backcountry, which I'll mention in a moment, and what we're calling the dynamic character, the river corridors, where you're gonna to expect to see a lot more people is certainly in the, the northern stretches of the East Branch. Um, what we're trying to do here is establish a balance between these non-motorized non -motorized recreation and the natural resources in these areas. This is the place where you may find things like uh, additional trails or improved trails, uh, the huts that are out there, primitive restrooms and campsites, interpretive signs, some of the things that you might normally expect to see in a national monument. With, again, with a the type of activities that are found in many places throughout the mine, including hiking, uh, in some places mountain biking, fishing, and so forth. And here's some examples of the, the roads that are currently out there. Uh, in some places, the existing bridges have been taken out. Some places, there's rudimentary covers over the streams uh, that do provide a, a network of, uh, of access ways throughout the mine, especially going north-south. On the left is one of the many ponds that are found throughout the monument area. Now the backcountry is one of the largest components of the management areas. These are the wilder, steeper, more, more remote parts of the monument that's shown in dark green right here. Um, many of the, 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 the mountains are, are named, some of them aren't named. There are established trails to the top of some of them. As I said before, the International Appalachian Trail goes through it. Uh, Barner Mountain is in the, the lower uh, part of this green area. Some places there are existing structures that would be preserved as part of the, the vision plan for these areas. But it's important to think that this is an area where the resources, the resource value, the slopes, the woods, and so forth, are really the driving force behind the development of the management framework. That the natural ecological practice, uh, processes are carefully preserved in, its, uh, in, its, uh, in doing the vision plan. Now, when we set out to define where the boundaries might be, we took a look at things like the IAT, International Appalachian Trail, which is that dotted line that courses its way through here. Uh, the steep areas that are found along the mountains uh, sides and the mountain tops are the areas that are shown in the tan color. And then we have uh, the huts that have been created by the International Appalachian Trail that are part of this area. So you start to overlay uh, the green areas on top of that, then you start to see it, it makes a lot of sense that these areas are more remote. The people that are going to go here are going to have a much different expectation of what sort of facilities to expect, what sort of experience, how many people they're expecting to see, and so forth. Uh, these areas are probably going to have limited and very dispersed facilities. Uh, there won't be, a, we'd like to think that people who go there will not have an expectation for 
the sort of activities and facilities that you may find in the more developed areas. It probably will not be toilets and campgrounds. And that the, one of the realities of people uh, recreating in this area is going to be the lack of services and the rudimentary facilities. You have to, people who go there are going to have to accept the fact that when you go there, you may be pretty much on your own. Now, one of the interesting things about that is to compare uh, the National Monument uh, to what the Baxter State Park people call their trail-free zones, which is this map right here. These areas that are colored um, on this map uh, be, then superimpose the, uh, the backcountry area. You can see that there's um, a lot of synergy between Baxter State Park and the areas for uh, that we're calling the backcountry areas here. These are areas that uh, will provide a buffer around Baxter State Park and a continuation of the habitats that's so critical uh, to the management of Baxter State Park. So that in a nutshell is the preliminary management areas, the monument gateways, the purple dots, the development recreation areas around the, uh, the existing roads, the river corridors in some areas that are broken down into sub uh, areas, the non-intensive use areas where you may find a lot of recreation taking place using the existing road system, um, and then the backcountry areas. However, there's an area that, as you can see, just to the right uh, of Katahdin Lake there, about <clears throat> three quarters of the way down the map, that is Hatchard. And it's called, we're calling it a future planning overlay district. And what that means is that this is an area that may be adjusted based upon more detailed future planning. There's been a lot of questions raised by many people about things such as the location of the loop road. Uh, is that too close to uh, the border of Baxter State Park, as you can see jutting into uh, the National Monument right there. Uh, is the, the loop road too long? Um, what do you do about access to um, some of the mountains? Is this the proper place? So there's a lot of discussions that are happening right now that are going to feed into the ultimate uh, decision-making process that will guide the development of the management areas. Terry, there's actually, um, as we were going through this, a couple other uh, future planning areas that we, we are adding to the, to the mix that aren't reflected on this map. And one of them would be up on the northern part um, where we're, the integration between the access and uh, the use of the river corridor. And then down at the lower northern end, um, different ways that people get into the monument potentially in the future. But I, I think what we tried to do is set up a process through the management framework, which would allow us to identify areas that we don't know the, all the answers to at this point, and they really need a little further um, flexibility and discussion as, as the monument um, starts to establish itself a little bit more. So we tried to add in some of these areas where we've had a lot of different um, discussions at this point. So those will also be reflected on the final product. Noel. Where's the next steps? <laughs> so the next steps are uh, fits and starts, but we're um, in the currently in our sort of final, I'd call it our final public outreach uh, process, uh, where we're um, trying to go around and, and let everybody know what we've actually done um, as uh, in terms of listening to their feedback and developing the management framework and the foundation document. Um, we're in the final stages of drafting the final foundation document right now, and that should be done this fall, as well as the, the final version of the management framework. Um, we're, we're soliciting feedback from Park Service and um, tribal representatives on both of these documents currently. So that's where we're headed. And now we're happy to answer, or if Tim, you want to add anything? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Well, thank you. No, that was, uh, that's where we're at. I think part of the, some of the things that a proclamation, the deeds told us a lot of things. A lot of these right of ways, um, for instance, those roads you saw come into the mine, only three roads we could bring the public in legally. Uh, the other ones we only have management uh, rights to. So uh, that's why the concentration, if you've been up to the Savoyas area, the American Thread Road is our access. The Grandin Road is where most people come in, but no one, that's a private road that we do not have, uh, we, don't, we don't have any rights on that road. 
So, um, in fact, is right now we're actually making the American Thread Road more passable to a, to a vehicle. Uh, we started last week. Um, the things that, that came with the deeds, that's where the access piece it's prescribed very, uh, very clearly where hunting would be allowed and where snowmobiling would be allowed. Um, and it doesn't, you know, some of the people are, because it's allowed there, the other areas would then go back and reflect our management policies, which, so they're not disallowed, but they'd have to go through a rigorous environmental uh, assessment or even an EIA to do certain things. So the hunting and the, uh, and the, and the snowmobiling were basically when we, when the deeds came, they had, they were written in there. And that is where a lot of the, uh, the right of ways from, uh, for the logging truck sharing roads, um, the only place on the loop road that the logging trucks can go is actually the state has a right of way there. No one out in the, the private do not, but the state has a right of way. Uh, it's probably not clear on the map, but that area north of the Todden Lake is actually BPL land. It is not part of Baxter. So um, that that is somewhat confusing to people. Um, part of the idea of this is to make this a, uh, a an experience that everybody could have a good experience, but they can't all have it in the same place. And so there's different areas. That's why we came up. In the old ways with the Park Service, the last, couple of decades we've done general management plans which were very detailed and they were un, they were unimplementable they took seven years they cost a lot of money and they were obsolete by the time they they got there and you still had to do more compliance so this is one of the first actual attempts to go back and do a framework type mapping so that these are the kind of activities that will be okay or acceptable by resources in these certain areas, and then you go back and you do separate compliance on all of those. So, for instance, uh, the viewpoint it needs to be upgraded. We will do comp so separate environmental documents to upgrade that area uh, so the public can weigh in. Otherwise, this document becomes so voluminous that it never goes anywhere, and that's the reason that that we've gone to the, to this method. As Noel said and Terry, we went we. We've had about seven or eight, nine, ten meetings, and we in the last year we've heard the same things over and over again. So that's that's what this reflects. And those areas with the crosshatch, and there's actually three major ones. Um, those are where we've heard a lot of different areas, and so we've shown those. Is this is going to take more study, and these are the kinds of things we'll look at. Will we cut off this hop of the loop road? Is there another way? Uh, how do you make access? for the day tripper in the river because the easy, the easy float, you can't, you have to walk a mile and a half for your canoe to get out of the easy float. Um, the access from the south, which didn't show in these maps, we don't have access up from Millinocket. So that is another spot. If that could happen, we would have, uh, we, we developed something down there. The other thing that we talked about, there was reserved rights for this that came with it for up to seven years for the previous owner to buy to build uh, things that are not they're non-federal actions and uh, and some of that is going on um, at this time a trail's already been built uh, there's a contact center uh, envisioned so um, that's that's where we're at we'd love to answer any of the questions a lot of uh, uh, the lines are not completely definitive I just lost everything here um, uh, can you still hear me? My screen yeah. just went dead. Yeah, we can still yeah. hear you, Tim. Your your yeah. face is just paused. That's all. Well, that's probably a good thing. So I think uh, as I get reconnected here, um, I'll you know uh, quit talking. I would you know Isabel Ashton is on. I think Jean Roy is on as all as well. And they are Jean. You know they are the uh, Isabel is the new re integrated resource chief for the for the park. She's been here for about a month. And Jean uh, is the interp chief of interpretation, and she's been here for almost a year. And so uh, that's where we're at. And uh, since I can't see anymore, well, I'm reconnecting. Uh, no, I'll turn it back to you, and I'd be happy. Would be happy to answer any questions or comments people have. But I can't see them right now. Great. Now I think Ken will um, turn it back to you for any questions. 
Actually, I'm Sarah's gonna Sarah, sorry. handle the question. No, that's fine. That we we hadn't decided that, but I'll let her take over. We'll keep passing it around the virtual room. Um, so we do have some various questions. A couple folks um, had to drop off, but I told them that I would ask the questions and give them the answers um, tomorrow. Um, the first one is: Can you share more about how you work with the indigenous populations who consider this sacred ground? Yeah, um, from the get-go, we had established um, a working relationship with representatives from all the main tribes, um, and the National Park Service is actually really proactively working with them on this on this site. Um, we've had multiple meetings where we sat down and discussed their relationship to the monument, um, and I've been working with them very closely to try to um, craft language that is reflective not only of the things, some of the things that we've talked about, but their perspective on it. It's, it's actually from, from my work, I can, I can speak selfishly to it. It's, it's really, really interesting. And um, I think to the credit to the Park Service and to the tribal representatives, they're working really well together to try to um, reflect all of the things that are important uh, to them and um, try to understand, you know, how we can work together. So in this foundation document is really where you're going to see that reflected quite a bit um, and how, um, you know, the, the tribal um, history and significance of, of the monument is going to be reflected in, in the way that we try to weave it in to the document. So to answer part of that, all four, all four of the tribes I've seen the language and we've uh, been very, spent a lot of time ma making sure that the language fits in. So they've seen the writing. So it's not, we're not trying to, they, we're not trying to paraphrase things. And so that's taken quite a bit of time of the, uh, between the, between the, all the Wabanaki people. So, so that's been an effort, that, like I said, Noel said, the Park Service has worked on and we've, we were having meetings about every quarter. Now they've gone to, to Zoom, but that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on, uh, and we look at it as part of our management strategy with them, not just with the framework, but with with other things. I would say they didn't just see the language; they actually have participated in writing the language. So that's that's pretty, correct. Yeah. Great. Uh, so the next question is: Are you collecting information about native species that are endemic? I'll let Tim answer that question. Um, I, if from the management framework perspective, I think we would set up the process for that to happen and identify certain things as data gaps. But but my understanding is that these are ongoing processes that the Park Service is going to have to. Um, yeah. In the future. I, I see Isabel has has her hand up. But yes, and I let her go here. But that is as when we do these, we have a we have a set of planning needs, and that's one of them. That's been high on our list. And Isabel's uh, actually started working on um, the indigenous plants and on, we've actually started on heavily mapping certain areas of the monument, but go ahead, Isabel, you can take it from there. No, that's all I was gonna say is one of the priorities whenever um, the Park Service has new lands, they've been trying to inventory what is in the monument. And so one of our first steps was doing a detailed, what we would call a vegetation map that includes you know, vegetation and rare plants and those sorts of things. And so we have a part of it done. We're a couple of years from having everything done. It's not a, it's not a quick process to do that. It's a lot, it's a big park. So we're working on it though. This is, all, this is also very unusual. Most park service lands that we get have been public lands before. This has never been public land. So a lot of that data that you see in other areas, whether it came from, you know, the forest service to BLM, uh, a state park um, or uh, um, uh, or Department of Defense, we get a lot of stuff. There's been a lot of that mapping going on. And, you know, my favorite story about this is that when I went to the SHPO's office in Augusta and asked about what they had there for historic structures and things in the monument, and they had one note that Myron Avery, who most of you know, may know who he was, that he was one of the ones that got the Appalachian Trail to end on Mount Katahdin instead of Mount Washington. He went by Lunkasu, which is where, you know, Don Fendler was, was found. And there's a sporting campus been there since at least 1886. 
And they said there were three buildings there in 1932. That was the entire that was the entire Shippo's office take on the monument. So that's that's a data gap here that we are starting uh, from uh, less knowledge than most places we get that were public lands. Very interesting. Um, a similar question, um, you might have a similar answer, but how are we looking to protect the other species in the area from human contact? You guys want to take a whack at that? I, I, again, I'll start from the management framework because it's my own, that's my, my task, but I think what we've tried to do in the management uh, is really set up areas, uh, uh, sort of the high level management uh, language that the Park Service can use to, to identify um, you know, how, how that um, different areas are going to be treated. Um, and I will say, and I think we didn't hit on this like hard enough at the very beginning, but everything that we've done starts from the perspective of the resource and it kind of works down, works down from there. So the primary objective is protection of the resource and the management framework. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what those other things you were talking about, because uh, we, we look at it holistically and uh, if there was something specific, I, I uh, with the question, uh, we don't pick and choose. Uh, we take a look at what's there and try and keep it as natural as possible. Uh, great. So the next question, I think this is referring to the last map that you had up, but is there a difference in the color gradation of the blue areas, how they go from lighter, lighter to dark, darker blue? Yes. When we, when we started to talk about um, uh, the river corridor as a unique place, um, again, one of the roundtable discussions we had uh, someone made the comment well, you, that said that, um, you know, the river is made up of different personalities. Depending upon where you are, uh, it can be wild, and it can be untamed, it can be gentle. You got to reflect that in the management strategy. And so with that, uh, we came to the notion of, of subdividing the river, the way we looked at the river, into uh, more unified sub areas. And that's where we're at right now. That was directly as a result of comments that we heard from participants um, in, in the public uh, engagement process. Um, and then the last question is, um, are you willing to share these slides with the group? I don't think we have a problem with that, but we'll have to check with Tim and see how we um, maybe post these. Actually, uh, we post these on our website anyway. Yeah. And we will also have this recording on our website as well. <laughs> hey, Tim, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the visitor, visitor levels that you've seen this year? I heard you speak the other day. What's happened during the pandemic? So, kind of interesting. Um, you know, we only have good numbers for three years. Like, we have nine counters. And... Um, just to start, the total sum of visitation for 2018 from our counters was 20,550 visitors. We, we count two visitors per car, and we haven't done a scientific study, but we know that that's in the general realm of other social studies that we've had in other parks. It runs from, in fact, it's conservative. They're usually about 2.1, 2.2. So anyway, and in 2019, we had 22,350, so it went up about 10%. The summer visitation for this year through the 30th of September is 23,025. So we've already exceeded last year without October being in there. Um, now, there's two things going on here, unfortunately. The 2000 summer season, 20, was the first year we had signs on the interstate, and I was hoping that we could see that would make a difference. But after COVID, who knows what made the difference? Uh, so, but it's kind of interesting to look at the main travel months to date this year, June, July, August, September, there's a steady percentage increase in the total visitation, but there's even a higher percentage increase on the loop road and the north entrance road, which are two main visitor use roads. Now, you know, percentages, I don't like to use percentages because we don't have high visitation. So the percentages sound, they sound high, but the numbers aren't that high because when you go from 400 cars 
a month to 600 a month, that's a, you know, a 50% increase, but it's only 200 cars. So just to take it with that. Um, for the total year, the to for the season to date, the total visitation is up 28%. And each month has shown an increase over the previous months. And now June was 9%, July 18, August 27, September 44, just kept going up. For the season to date, the loop road is up 87%. It's almost double. Each road is going to increase the other month. September uh, uh, was uh, 44, excuse me, that's the north entrance. The loop road is up 87%, and the September was up 110%. Part of that can be attributed that the leaves were early, because some of that didn't slop over to November. So we've had 8,700 visitors come over the loop road. Um, so, uh, you know, the percentages are substantial. But for instance, the busiest day in Loop Road was 129 visitors spread out over the day on the 26th of September. Now the the view area did get congested that day. That's probably, but that's that's where we were at with fall colors. Um, the other thing I've gotten calls on is the, you hear a lot of stories about how resources have been hammered in the parks. We didn't see it. Uh, I think we're far enough away from an urban area. And I was talking to the Portland paper. They said Acadia didn't see it either. So we didn't see the litter problems that are happening, like Delaware Water Gap and some of those places that are near the, the area. So we saw a lot of visitors, uh, a lot of increase. Oh, we haven't run the numbers where they signed in at the contact centers. That's the only place we have to treat plates. But we know we had a lot of mainers come in this year. Um, we always do, but it, it was a, a high percentage. And then uh, as, the, as the season went on and we saw the – the governor's restrictions changed. We saw more of the New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey plates come in. So um, we have the capacity to take it, the carrying capacity. Um, we social distancing. The trails are mostly the old logging roads. And so social distancing is actually easier, easier to take care of that way. And we actually had one additional question that was added, which is, um, has there been a final decision about the north-south road connection in the monument? I'm not aware of any north-south road in the monument. There's uh, the old road that actually, the old, old road that came up actually crossed, the, the crossing over the Wastatica is not on, it's not on park land and it's, it crosses private land, and that old bridge on the Wasatica is actually BPL land, and that bridge is impassable. So we have not uh, talked. Of, you mean that car route is not even in our planning mode at this time. We had some comments. Uh, I think more people would. Uh, we get more comments about, you know, what can walk through. Can I? How far can I bike on the old roads? But reestablishing across that with that that bridge is is not not on our land at all. We'd have to cross land we do not own. That's not been that's that that's come up occasionally, uh, but um, that's been way in the minority. All right. Are you talking? Unless you're talking about a north south road coming out of Millinocket, if that's the question. I don't know Does what the it, question is. That is something that is, you know, that's why you see a hatch mark down and if you ever got a connection up from Millinocket. All right, before I hand it back to Ken to close it out, um, just while I have everybody's attention, I wanna let folks know about our next community conversation. So we will be having another community conversation on the 27th at 7 p.m. Um, the title of this talk is The Deals Made, The Money Involved, and the Lack of Transparency in the, in the Pursuit of Big Hydro. Um, we're going to have three speakers for that event. We're going to have Meg Sheehan, from, who is a coordinator of NAMRA. Um, Mark Krezewick, who is a Sierra Club staff person who's in charge of the beyond coal campaign for the Eastern region. And then we're gonna have K 
Kevin Cassidy, who is a senior staff attorney at Lewis and Clark um, School Earth Law Center, uh, Earthrise Law Center. You can learn more about that event and register at crclub.org forward slash Maine. And I'll hand it over to Ken. Oh, Ken, it looks like you are muted. I live on Zoom, you think I would know better. Um, I'll make this really quick. I just want to thank Noel and Terry and Tim for coming and meeting and presenting with us tonight and for everybody else joining us. There are a couple things posted in the chat that hopefully you got to see both the link to the proclamation and also to the website that's um, the planning website for Katahdin Woods and Waters that um, I think Andy put up there. I'm, you know, this is coming toward the finish line, probably none too soon for those who've been working on it for years, but I think there's still opportunities to weigh in, especially as the draft, you know, framework and um, foundation document get out there in the world. So I'm encur I encourage you to do that. And more than anything else, I'd encourage you to get up there and see the monument. So I think that's probably it. I can't see anybody anymore because it just says thank you on my screen. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Have a great evening. Okay. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.